I would try to look into the mirror and shave without looking myself in the eye. I had become my dad, and um, it was just too much to bear because I was doing to my wife what my dad did to me, in that it's pull away, pull away. Uh, it was a hard, hard time for me. But I started in a, a small little Pentecostal church. My dad was a preacher, but he is also an alcoholic. And uh, it started when I was 11, that when there is addiction in the home, you can't talk outside the family. And mom beat the crap out of me uh, for telling anybody what went on in the house. The constant message was, you're not worth anything and you'll never make it. In fact, when I left home at 17, that was the last thing my dad told me. He didn't want me to leave. He said, you'll never make it. So I left home and I put a little band together and the Imperials heard me and they said, you want to come to Nashville and try out? So I, I did and they hired me. I was 22. But I tried to act like none of the stuff in my childhood happened. I just tried to act, you know, it's just done, gone, you know, over here. But yet, when 17 years of your life, you have heard a thousand times, you're not worth anything, you're not worth the salt that goes on your bread. I tell you, after a while, you begin to believe it. But I was in New York. I was 26 with Tori, my wife, and we were staying at, at uh, her brother's house. And there were three Heinekens. And I thought, well, everybody else, you know, has. So I'll, I'll just have this and cool down in my head, you know. And so I drank the first one. And I started feeling something. And so I drank another one. And I felt even better. Those voices started getting quiet. And so I had the third. But if anybody knows anything about alcohol, within four hours it's all gone. And then you start feeling very, very guilty that you're a gospel singer, but you're trying to numb your feelings. And then it started a cycle. Or, uh, probably about eight or nine years of just living in secret and my wife not even knowing what was going on. It was in the mid 80s that my world collapsed and I just couldn't take it anymore. And I wound up in Memphis at the Civic Center there. Uh, my band and I were playing, sold out house. And I was in the dressing room on the floor crying so hard that, that, you know, mucus and everything else was just rolling out of my mouth and I couldn't stop. And I was begging God, heal me or kill me. I can't live this way anymore. I cannot live this way. I surrendered. I just surrendered and said, God, you know, whatever it takes, I will do it. I will do it. I started going to a therapist you know, and a Christian counselor that could start combating uh, childhood trauma that had never been addressed. And what I began to learn was I wasn't a bad person trying to get good. I was a sick person that needed to be well. And that started a long process. I was down at Mark Lowry's house. There was a man and he was dying of cancer. And his son said, would he just come by and say hello? It would mean so much to my dad. So I said yes, and I took my acoustic guitar and went to the hospital. And when I walked in, I was shocked at how much he looked like my dad. And But the first thing he told me, he said, Russ, I've lived a long life and I've served Jesus. I've taught my boys how to live. And if God doesn't heal me, I'm gonna teach my boys how to die. That's a dad. That's a dad. And I, then I asked him, I said, uh, Bishop Jones, Franklin Jones, I said, would you pray for me? And he stands up and he puts his hand on my shoulders. And I'm looking up into his eyes just like my dad. He had blue eyes just like my dad. And he starts praying. And I am just overcome. And I start crying. And I collapse to my knees crying so hard I can't stop. It was just down in the belly of my, my soul, my stomach, and it was coming out. 
And he said, Russ, I'm so proud of you, what you've done with your life. He said, God is so happy with what you've done and began to affirm me. When I stood up, after 15, 20 minutes, something was different about me. Something was different. I went back to Mark's house and Tori saw me. And the first thing she says, what happened to you? She saw it in my face. And I said, I was just affirmed by a dad. And my Heavenly Father was using this man that looked like my dad to affirm me. It's like I stepped into the role of a man. I stepped into the role of a father. Guilt says, you did something bad. Shame is, I am that thing that's bad. Jesus asked that uh, uh, the crippled guy, he said, would you be made whole? If I heal you, you can't sit here and beg anymore. You've been begging your whole life. And when that question came to me, uh, would you be made whole? And I thought about it. My whole world's going to change. And I said yes. And I had a new dad. If this story inspired you, take the steps to change your life. The first step is always to say, Jesus, help me. Come On, Let's Go distributes hundreds of similar stories of lives changed by Jesus Christ. If you want to be part of this vision, go.